Sophie's talk is titled The Art of Things Not Done, Prioritising the User Experience with the Kano Model. Please welcome Sophie to the stage. Thank you very much, Gavin. Oh, good, my microphone's working. There was some discussion backstage about placement on my various collection of lapels here. Um, it's really super to be here. I, this is my first NUX, um, partly because until three months ago, I was a resident of the far southwest in Devon and uh, moved up to Leeds in July. So this is all quite new and exciting to be all up north. Um, as Gavin said, I'm sort of, basically, I, I sort of do strategic UX consultancy, so I consult around user-centered digital strategy and also sort of lead user-centered design teams and help people figure out in particular things like how to embed user-centered design UX into Agile. But today I'm gonna to talk about the art of things not done. Um, and as Gavin said, I'm currently working for the Department of Work and Pensions and done a lot of government work. And you know, you probably are familiar with the fantastic GDS design principles. And the one we talk about most often obviously is start with user needs um, user needs, not government needs. That's principle number one that we work with. We don't tend to talk necessarily quite so much about this one, which is the second of the principles. Right up there straight after start with needs, do less. Um, and doing less doesn't always sound you know, quite so exciting, doesn't it? I mean, doing less doesn't sound good. Um, why would you want to do less? So this is just after lunch and you're a bit sleepy. I thought we'd start with a show of hands just to show that you're all actually not listening. <laughs> So let's have a little show of hands for who has worked on a project where they got to deliver everything they intended and envisioned in terms of the user experience, that so that got out there into the world. Is anyone brave enough to put their hand up at this point? <laughs> we don't have any superstars in the building. We all need to go home. Who has worked on a project and maybe there was some compromise involved in you know, what you wanted the user experience to be and what you could actually get out the door. Who's gonna put their hand up to that one? Yes. That's quite common, isn't it? So it's really important, I think, that as UXers, given that that is a fairly universal experience, that we learn to have conversations about those compromises so that we have more control over what doesn't get done rather than those decisions being made by other people who perhaps aren't thinking in user experience ways. Um, <laughs> Moon is not the only one to show you cats, what can I say? Because the point here though is amazing design work that sits in a drawer isn't any use to anybody. Cats sat in drawers are cute. Designs sat in drawers are a waste of the time and money that you spent making them. There is no point designing a user experience if no user ever gets to experience it. And fair enough, sometimes our job is to be horizon scanning. We are asked and tasked with getting out there and dreaming the impossible dream, coming up with a vision. And this is often the really fun part of our job. We get to ideate and prototype, we're innovating and you know, all of that. And that's great because you know, ambitious prototypes and concepts can be really powerful ways to transform the willingness of the stakeholders and the decision makers that we work with to invest in making that sort of thing a reality. But the danger, I think, is that because we're so excited about this future and we're so excited about the user experience, that we don't take that step back and really communicate what the value of that experience is to people. And sooner or later, our vision of this kind of sunlit uplands of uninterrupted customer delight and self-actualization is going to hit up against this simple truth. There is always more to build than you have the people, time, and money for. Always. We will come back to uh, Jeff Patton and the source of this quote a little bit later on in this story. So today I'm going to basically share with you a couple of concepts and a really super simple but awesome tool that I tend to often use to help the sort of stakeholders and more senior decision makers that I'm working with deliver a great user experience despite these inevitable constraints. So the first thing to sort of grok as a UXer, if you haven't come across it already, is this. This is Project Management 101. So it's super handy because the project managers or delivery managers or people like that that you're working with, they, they know about this already. 
Um, this is known as the iron triangle. And it's the iron triangle because you cannot change one of these elements without one of the others giving. So if you want to reduce the cost, you're going to have to either reduce quality or reduce the scope, reduce the features of what you're building. If you want to increase the scope, and doesn't everybody always want to increase the scope, quality's got to go down, or you've got to spend more time and more money on it. And if you want to increase the quality, then either the cost or the scope has got to give. And this is important because, you know, in, in my ideal world, what I like to talk to people about is, you know, how do we make quality non-negotiable? And in Agile, this is actually something that in many ways, you know, development has got better than us. So because of its sort of roots in dev, if you look at sort of agile methodologies, particularly things like extreme programming, in that concept of the definition of done, obviously often baked right into that is an idea of code quality. So that you know, the code quality, the standard of the production ready system um, is perhaps better accepted. But then what tends to sometimes happen in agile is that the quality compromise comes in the user experience. Um, so it becomes about completing more stories, building more features, keeping that technical quality high, but maybe you know, saying, oh, we don't need to, to you know, build the user interface in quite this way, or we can make these compromises over here. So what we need to try and do as UXers is to rebalance this triangle in favor of quality of experience. And to do that, we need to fight this fallacy that, that more, in particular more scope, is always better. Here's a simple and slightly overblown example, just to make my point. On the left here, you have the Venga giant. The Venga giant is officially the most functional pen knife in the world. It is in the Guinness Book of Records. It has 87 tools, 141 separate functions, and it is nine inches long and weighs 32 ounces. By contrast, the Leatherman Micra on the left is about two and a half inches long, it's about this big. Weighs less than two ounces, it fits in your pocket, goes in your key ring. Um, it has just seven tools and does 10 jobs. And the point of here is obviously, I mean, the Venga giant, you know, they made this as a bit of a joke to get in the Guinness Book of Records. They don't really think it's a valid pen knife. But, you know, for most people, there's not really a contest between which of these two pen knives is actually the most useful and usable tool. Um, so there's a classic trade-off here about the sort of, you know, complexity versus usability, um, the value of simplicity. But it's also a way of starting to think about where do we compromise when we don't have so much time and money? And how is that not necessarily about sacrificing the experience? And there's a sort of really concrete and extreme example where I've had to sort of try and apply this to something I myself was working on, was when my husband and I were organizing DigPen, which was a grassroots community conference for digital makers based down in the southwest in Devon and Cornwall. And by the end of it, we were getting comments like this, which is amazing. Only being out of the country will keep me away from the next one. Um, but it wasn't always like that. When we first took it over, it had been a bit of a sort of scrappy kind of an unconference. Um, you know, and the sort of quality had suffered, and we were starting to, you know, people were sort of starting to lose interest and not coming. And we thought, well, we really need to sort of build this up sometime, somehow. Um, you know, it'd be good to spend a little bit of money, but we thought, because there's not so much trust in the brand at this point, probably the most we can charge for this conference is about £10. Um, so we came to this question, how do you deliver a kick-ass web conference for less than £10 a head? Um, so we want to increase quality for a very slight increase in cost. So we're going to have to be absolutely ruthless about scope. So in trying to answer this question, you get to questions like this. Is a bad lunch better than no lunch? Um, and a model I find really useful when thinking about these kind of scope quality cost trade-offs is a thing called the Kano model, which Gavin mentioned in the introduction. A Kano model plots things on two axes. So on the x-axis, we have feature sophistication from not present at all through sort of poor kind of basic information and right up to best of breed. And then on the other axis, we have customer or user satisfaction from, you know, really pissed off, unhappy customers through sort of disappointed, kind of neutral, right up to sort of, you know, satisfied and then sort of delighted ones. And when you think about sort of features of your product or service, there are three core places and sort of um, directions that they fit on this graph. So the first one is linear features. Most features are linear. 
And with linear features, basically, the better the feature, the happier the customer. So these are things like price, build quality, ease of use. If we were talking about a car, they'd be things like fuel efficiency, engine power, boot space, things like that. Um, if they're poor or not present, you've got disappointed customers. And only a best of breed implementation is really going to get people excited about your product. Um, so these are one-dimensional sort of performance payoffs. More performance generally pays off with these features and investing more in sophistication. Um, sometimes you get a little kind of thing like this. So depending on what it is, sometimes not having it there is better than having it there, but it'd be badly. This is usually when there's something about this feature that you can effectively sort of hand off to some other product, some other service. So in our car example, this might be something like a built-in sat-nav. So bad built-in sat-nav, you just think, well, this is pointless, and I've pay obviously somehow paid extra money for this bad built-in sat-nav. But you can solve that problem by getting another sat-nav and getting a separate unit, um, back when you know, built-in sat-navs weren't very good. So that's an example where perhaps they'd have been better not to put the sat-nav in at all. Um, the next axis is the sort of must-have basic expectations. And on a car, there'd be things like brakes and tires. So bad brakes, bad. Bad brakes, bad. Uh, not very good brakes, not particularly good. You have to get to a certain basic level where people are happy that the car is going to stop. But there's a limit to how delighted somebody is going to get with their braking performance. There is a reason we sell cars on 0 to 60 speed and not on 60 to 0 speed. Even if possibly we ought to be doing the 60 to 0, because that would be safety. You know, it doesn't get customers excited. Um, so they do get a bit happier, but they're not you know, ecstatic. And the final class is the sort of attractive excitement generator. So the words are a bit odd because this has all been translated from Japanese, um, and I'm not particularly good at Japanese. Um, no one notices if they aren't there. Um, even a moderately good implementation can keep people happy. And you, know, you don't actually have to be right over in the top right to, to get people delighted and excited about your product. So this might be something like, say, sort of automated parking systems. So, you know, right now, I'm just pretty much amazed that a car can park itself at all. I'm not bitching about, you know, it can do the reverse into the parking space, but it can't parallel park, you know. So I'm pretty delighted that it will do it at all. And if I have a car, as I do, that doesn't park itself, I'm not feeling particularly disappointed in, in, in the car that I have. I'm, I'm sort of okay with not having that feature present. So if we think about our sort of cash track local conference, we think about our question of lunch. Where's my lunch gone? There we go. Lunch. Lunch, it's over here. So as long as I manage my attendees' expectations all right, they'll probably be all right. If I'm just clear, we're not doing lunch. Go out and get sandwiches. What they don't probably want is soggy little egg and cress you know, on white bread. They're probably going to be disappointed by that. And the, the posher the lunch gets, the happier people are. We had a nice lunch, I thought, by the way, just to reassure Barry, who sat down there. Nice lunch. Um, <laughs> So the absence may not disappoint. Poor implementation is going to disappoint or dissatisfy my audience. And if I could afford a best of breed implementation on £10 a head, you'd all be very, very happy. I can't, so we're not doing lunch. Um, drinking water, as I discovered to my cost, is a basic expectation. If you don't give your delegates drinking water, they kind of get really angsty at you. But, you know, I'm not getting much of an up in terms of satisfaction of my conference audience by putting really fancy Perrier out versus just fairly straightforward tap water. It's a bit nicer, but no one's going like, oh, wow, the water. Um, <laughs> if I want to get a cheap kind of boost of customer delight, I could do something like cake with the tea and coffee. And these don't necessarily need to be the best cakes in the world. First of all, no one's going to notice if I don't give them cake with the tea and coffee. They're probably all right. Um, but it doesn't need to be, you know, we don't need a three-tier wedding cake and Mary, Mary Berry standing there doing something. You know, fairly straightforward muffins are probably going to have people going, oh, cool, there are muffins and a bit of a Victoria sponge, and this is all quite nice. Um, but you get a funny thing with the cake. So year one, everyone's like, wow, there's cake. This is great. And year two, they're kind of, you know what? <laughs> Not as good as last year. And year three... Yeah, there's no cake. What the f is happening to this conference? It's gone right downhill. Um, and this is also something that they talk about in the Kenyan model. So this is expectation escalation. What happens with our attractive excitement generators is you go from I love it, and it becomes an expectation. It becomes a sort of basic expectation that people expect. Um, so something like uh, in the UK, 
having air conditioning in your car back in 1995, that was quite new and novel. You didn't die on the motorway on a hot day. Um, these days, you're kind of like, it doesn't does have air con. What kind of car is this? Um, or, you know, to 2015, cars apart park themselves, pretty exciting. You know, I'm guessing by about 2025, you know, we kind of like, what? It doesn't park itself. You want me to park my own car? Good grief. Um, I'm trying to remember what I'm supposed to say. So, yeah, expectation escalation. So, and this isn't just about some of those sort of really innovative technical features. Um, so Tom Moore, who's now at Co-op and was at GDS, um, you know, one, he defines digital as using the people, processes, and technologies of the internet to meet people's raised expectations. And this is one of the challenges we have in digital is, you know, stuff that was okay, bad but okay as far as users were concerned maybe 10, 15 years ago, you know, people's expectations for a basic digital experience has just really kept going up and they just expect our products and services to hit a much higher benchmark because their expectation is being set by services like, you know, Facebook and Amazon and that's just what they think should be there. Um, so there's this slight danger with the Kano model um, that it encourages a certain amount of featureitis. What we need to do is come up with lots of innovative new features to stay ahead of the curve and delight our customers. Um, just a brief little aside, what, I mean, a brand that's quite interesting is, so I'm not gonna talk much about how brands fit into this. When I do a longer version of this talk, I talk a bit about brands, but Apple's quite an interesting brand because obviously as a premium brand, they really want to occupy that top right. You know, they're all about giving you a delightful experience that creates these enthusiastic fans who go out and advocate for people to use products. And what Apple are quite interesting about is that they fight this feature writers by not being afraid to challenge the stuff that's down here. So they say, you know what? We don't think a headphone jack is actually a must have anymore. And we're gonna take it out because what we've discovered is if we take out that component, we can now fit in the components that we need to create an amazing camera. So to give you a camera that's gonna sit right over there on the top right, and we think that trade-off is worth it. Time will tell if they're as right about the headphone jack as they were about the fact that we actually no longer needed DVD and CD drives in our laptops. But another way we can fight feature writers is by moving on to this idea of the user journey. So features don't exist in isolation. They exist as moments in a broader user journey. And so we need to think about experience as a whole and not just about individual moments and features. So at our conference, our high point in our experience might be that amazing speaker that you haven't seen before. Um, it wouldn't ever happen at this conference, but I'm sure we've all been to the ones where you're kind of like, this is just a half hour sales pitch, oh my goodness. Um, you know, and then you know, a solid sort of closing keynote maybe sort of rounds it out. And what's interesting here is the slight bastardization I do of this thing called the peak end rule. If you want to know a bit more of peak end rule, I really recommend this. But Daniel um, Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, is really good at some of this sort of basic psychology stuff. And what the peak end rule basically says is that people, in reflecting on an experience, they tend to remember the best bit, the worst bit, and the end. And this is important because when we talk about delighting customers, we're talking not just about how they feel in the moment, but how they remember and reflect on an experience. It's that all important way that products you know, create word of mouth, they create a buzz, we get engagement, we get repeat visitors. It's all about them, how you remember the experience, what you reflect on it being like. We want you to remember that the conference was great. We want you to tell your friends about it and come back next year. And that's all about how you're going to remember it this evening and tomorrow and on Monday. And these are the sort of things that are really going to stand out for you. And what the peak end rule starts suggest is the thing is, the experience doesn't need to be unremittingly amazing all the way through. Um, it doesn't actually need to be. We don't need to make everything that level. What we need to do is... So I was just checking the animation was happening. Find those peak points, amplify them. Can we take that up and create an even higher high? Really importantly, find our pain points. Find where our journey and our experience is dropping below people's sort of basic expectations. Where is it sitting in that top bottom left of the Kano grid? And get rid of them. Um, and make sure we end well. We don't have to 
end in an amazing way. That's the interesting thing about this. You don't have to go, woo! But it has to be on that positive side of the curve. Um, and that can be, if it's a sort of transaction, that can be as simple as, have I completed my goal? Have I got the thing out of this transaction that did well? Um, and in a way, this sort of explains that weird thing you sometimes get with customer satisfaction surveys. If you, at the end of a process, say to somebody, you know, how did you find that? Could you rate the transaction out of 10? And often you see an email service which is not really, really, really bad, and you've sat through lab tests and stuff and seen people unable to complete this journey. Your user satisfaction scores can still be quite high. And that's because of this thing, because if they got what they wanted at the end of it, they're actually quite satisfied. Um, you know, and they, they aren't necessarily sort of bringing up in their conscious all the pain that they had all the way through. And of course, with the customer satisfaction survey, you're not surveying the people who completely failed to get through it because of those horrible low points. And it's also remember, worth remembering that pain points aren't necessarily just features that your product has that are bad. They can also be pain points within the user's experience. Um, Giles Colborn, who I worked for at CX Partners, talks a lot about how a lot of the most delightful experiences when you ask people about what makes a product or a service delightful are these moments where a moment of potential anxiety in the experience is sort of effortlessly resolved. Um, so you think of something like Uber. So there's that anxiety when you're going to try and get a taxi. You're, you're in London or in Manchester. You know, I'm, I'm new to the city. I'm thinking, I need to get a cab. I'm not sure where I get a cab from. I don't know where it's going to stop. I don't know how much it's going to charge me. All those sort of anxieties about getting a cab. And what Uber has done is just removed that anxiety from that customer experience, that customer journey of booking a cab by just going, I can just go on the app, cab will show up, I get in it, that's all fine. So if we think back to our basic conference features, cake. Definitely do it. Definitely do the cake. Nice high point. Bad lunch? Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Kill it. Bad moment. Get rid of that. Um, after party? Just let's make sure it doesn't really suck. You know, it doesn't have to be the most amazing party in the world ever. Um, you know, but, but that's the sort of thing we're looking for. So that's kind of a ton of theory about how people experience services and what causes delight. But once we've got all this theory, we need a way of talking to it, about it to our teams and helping our teams to build a product roadmap that reflects it. Um, and the technique that I really like for this is back to Jeff Patton, who I mentioned earlier. So Jeff Patton has really popularized this idea of user story mapping um, or story mapping. Um, and I like, really love story mapping for several reasons. One, it's a great way to visualize your product backlog, and Jeff talks about this more in his blog post, if you, you, know, you don't have to get the book, you can just read the blog post. Um, I'll get the book as well. Because um, it really brings these two things together. So it brings together the idea of a customer journey over time. Uh, it helps you bring together this idea of within that journey, what are users' basic expectations? Uh, where can we eliminate pain points? Uh, what are those attractors within our product or service that are really going to generate excitement? And it brings all of that together with this sort of agile backlog and the user stories. Um, and it helps to solve some of the problems that you get, particularly with very big backlogs, the sort of flat backlog, where it's very difficult to understand how that backlog is going to translate into a real product. Um, so a story map basically looks something like this. So we start with the user journey, uh, start to end from left to right. And we plot out those sort of high level user goals within that. Um, and these are basically the sort of user needs. Um, so it's like one that we sort of got user needs confused with user stories a little bit. Um, but they're user needs in the sense of those aspects of the product and service that are kind of unchanging over time. You always know you've got a good need when, you know, if you imagine someone using your service 20, 30 years ago, they're probably trying to do the same sort of thing. So if you think of the taxi booking journey, you know, I'm, you know, find a taxi, get in the taxi, get to my destination, pay. That sort of thing. Those are, those are un, enduring aspects of my needs and goals from a taxi booking service. And then underneath that, you have the tasks. Um, so these are sort of steps that people need to take in order to achieve that particular goal in that stage of the, the product or service. Um, and so we arrange them underneath their goals. And so far, you know, this may well be looking quite familiar. You know, this is the basic structure of, of, of sort of you know, journey mapping and experience mapping and all those sorts of alignment mappings that we tend to do. Um, but then underneath that, we arrange 
sort of user stories, basically. Um, in order of priority from high to low underneath each of those tasks. Um, so this is giving us several things. Firstly, it's giving us a really great big visible picture of our product and service. Um, it's often really quick to make with the team, so you can do it very collaboratively, just with sort of post-its on a wall or a piece of brown paper. Um, and it helps make sure that you know, some of those products with product backlogs, like UX Cambridge, a guy talked about how agile can be a bit like swimming without goggles on. It's kind of like, you know, swim, 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 sprint, swim, 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 sprint, crash into the wall, look up, and you know, what is this thing that we've built? And, you know, we're missing an entire slice of the user journey, so we've got to crack on with it. Um, but also it helps you start to slice up your product into coherent phases. Um, and you have two basic strategies for slicing a product backlog. Um, you have shallow and wide. So you take a thin slice, through your stories, um, you say, OK, we want to sort of basically cover the whole of the user journey in, in a fairly thin way. And then you can sort of straighten that out so you don't want to draw a wiggly line on things. So you can straighten that out into swim lanes. And you get a sense of, you know, so that's our first release. That's our minimum viable product. And, you know, future releases down there. Your other option is basically narrow and deep. So we're going to cover a small part of the user journey. That's going to be our product. Over there, some other product. You know, oh, sorry, we're <coughs> clicking too fast. And so this is that idea that, you know, there's... It's not going to stay, is it? Let's just go back to that one, and I won't click. But, you know, some of these things, maybe we can hand off to another product or another service, and actually our thing doesn't need to do them. And some of these things, maybe, you know, we can do in a future release, but we can get away with doing it narrow and deep. I obviously managed to do the magic slide transition that I couldn't figure out how to do earlier, which is to get a slide to automatically progress. And I obviously didn't realize I managed to do it. Um, so what has that got to do with the Kano model? So the Kano model comes into how we decide which of those strategies is going to work best for our product. So if we think about our, our narrow and wide, our shallow and wide, that's like kind of do a little bit of everything, classic MVP sort of style. So what's the impact on the user? So perhaps we've got a a basic implementation of a must-have feature, that's giving us a kind of neutral experience. performance sort of feature, it's neutral again. Basic version of task three, that's a performance feature, let's say, that's neutral again. And our basic implementation of something that we think is more of an attractive feature, we've managed to satisfy our customer, so we're not doing too badly. But let's imagine that what we said is okay, that's all we've got, you know, time and budget to do this time. What if we don't do Task three, what if we try taking this sort of narrow and deep approach to do fewer things better? So we're still, let's invest that time and money in making our attractive feature good. So let's take the time we would have spent on feature three and shove it into doing better on feature four. So feature one, we're still neutral. Feature two, we're still neutral. If we've been canny about feature three, if we've identified one of those things that we can hand off to some other product or service that's not going to bug our customers, if it's absent, we can still be neutral on that one. But over here, on our attractive feature, we can get our delighted user. And I think this is where we start to move from this idea of minimum viable product into a minimum viable experience. Because... You know, particularly if we're talking about launching a initial product, you, you, know, you need to get some excitement going with people who are using it. It's not good enough for it just be okay. There's a ton of other products who probably do the kind of thing your product does. Um, and this is not going to get people adopting your service and your product. But if you can manage to get to this moment of delight, that's where you're going to hit those early people going, wow, this is really great. This is really doing a thing that I really need. And then, you, you know, if you carry that on, upgrading our features over different releases... You know, and we can add more satisfaction, more customer delight, and really sort of lift this up by just sort of dropping that one in the middle. So in my final minute, as I'm told, um, I really encourage you to try out this technique with your team. Some final tips. Um, know your customer journey before you start. So do all that great research that the other speakers have talked about. Um, understand your users' needs, behaviors, motivations, and pain points, because otherwise you're not going to spot you know, and be able to think about where the things fit on our Kano model. 
Um, use the Kano model to talk about how to deliver the best experience while doing less. One of the things I love about the Kano model is you can draw it on a whiteboard and senior stakeholders and decision makers get it really easily. You know, it's not a complicated thing and they can immediately see how this applies to products and services that they use themselves. Make it a whole team activity. It's a really great activity for just getting around some big bits of paper and doing it together. And I've written this one deliberately. No, include anyone who thinks they make the final decision on priority and scope. Hopefully, this is your product manager. Woohoo! Often, it's not. And the times when I've had this go kind of wrong is when there's someone very senior who we haven't had in the room, and they come in and we go, this is our story map, and here's our swim lanes, and this is our first release. And they're kind of like, why did you do this without me? This is my decision. So if you've got people like that, either have them in the room for the whole discussion, or make sure they come in very quickly afterwards and they know that you're doing it, because otherwise, they can sort of just reject everything that you've just worked out as a team. And particularly if you're doing this within an agile or lean UX environment, I really, really recommend Jeff's book. It's not just about how to put some post-its on the wall. He goes right into how to write better user stories, how to work more effectively as a team. So that's really worth getting. Um, that's been a really whistle-stop tour. Um, this is usually an hour and a half workshop, so I've condensed it quite a lot to fit it into half an hour. Do come and chat with me in the break. I'll be hanging around for a drink afterwards. Love to talk to you a bit more about all of this. Um, and a version of the slides, that I, a slightly longer version from UX Cambridge are up on SlideShare if you'd like to see them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, you were all quite quiet in the Q&A in that oh. session. I think it's just because you were taking a lot in. Yeah, um, that. Do you have a question? I do, funnily oh. enough. I was going to say service design, but I'm not going to. Um, you can say service design. You've done a lot in your time in the industry, and you've worked in a lot of yeah. different places. Have you used something like that where you've worked and you found it's worked really well, what was it? And what were the best outcomes? What were the best outcomes? Where are a couple of examples of using it and it being really effective? Um, the photo I showed of the round brown paper was when we did it um, when I was working at the team at Land Registry. Um, and we'd absolutely gone into that situation where when you looked at the backlog, even though it was sort of prioritized, there was just that feeling of there's stuff here we don't have. And we had to go into... GDS assessment, it was in about two months' time. And one thing they're really rightly hot on in the GDS assessment is, have you done the end-to-end -end user journey? And I was just thinking, I don't know that we've got the end-to-end -end user journey and any plan to deliver it. Um, and the product manager wasn't sure how to go about trying to sort of rebuild his backlog. And I said, well, we can do this thing called story mapping. And we did it in about three hours. It was an afternoon as a whole team. Um, and that went really well, because you know, some of the prioritization is, is like the dev saying, what's practical and what can't be done? And it helped the design team and the research team understand a lot more about the stuff. When they were pushing back and the people, you know, you, you know, in government, you're doing usability testing every two weeks and it can get quite demoralizing for the researchers because they're coming back test after test and going, users hate this, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. And for them to be in that conversation really with the devs where they were saying, yeah, but you see fixing that is going to take us three months because of the things that Lola were talking about. You know, we had legacy, we called it an iceberg project. There was this little bit of UI at the top and then this nightmare of systems underneath. Um, so it got the team really bought in. It gave the product manager a much bigger vision. I think I gave the BA a headache because at the end of it, the product manager turned to the BA and said, great, if you could just rewrite the entire backlog to look like that, that would be awesome. Um, so that was good. And we did have it up on the wall yeah. with mean, our done stamp. And yeah. do you think that helps a lot more with trying to kind of get more stakeholders involved? I think and, so. um, appreciative of the work involved? I think if you could have the room in the room during yeah. that discussion, and that's often, that you know, because it is still half a day or a day, so getting really senior people in as part of that can be difficult. But then there is that thing that, because, like, the product manager's been really involved in that discussion, they can then go and do that communication, I think, yeah. better to people. Um, and the outcome was that the thing we dropped, which we decided we didn't have to do, we were rightly pulled up for not having it in the journey. But GDS said, despite that, and that that means you have a broken user journey for a lot of your users. We're going to let this thing go into public beta for a limited period of time because everything else you've nailed. And it's a really great journey if we sort of slightly pretend we can't see that bit. And it was a bit that we knew was going to take like another six months to fix. So. And did you, did you bring it in eventually? Sorry? Did you bring it in eventually back into the... They're trying to build it. I haven't really mm. caught up with the story of 
yeah, it was that legacy thing that there was going to be a lot of behind the scenes build, rebuilding legacy. of microservices and APIs and databases. And, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Sophie. Thank you, Gavin. Cheers. Thank you very much.